Welcome, we're joined by British journalist and documentary filmmaker Jake Hanrahan, who recently covered the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war. Jake, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for inviting me. So first off, I want to ask, so you've previously worked at Vice News and you were detained by Turkish authorities some time ago, some years ago. Jake, can you tell us what happened, uh, why it happened and uh, the chronology of, of that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I was, it was 2015 and I was working as a reporter, a producer uh, for Vice News at the time. And I was covering the uh, the Kurdish uprising basically in Turkey at that time, the PKK youth wing. So Kurdish militants were fighting the government. And it was my third time covering this situation. You know, there'd been a lead up to this. It didn't come out of nowhere, despite what a lot of reporters say. So there was a good solid year before this happened. And I was covering it with them. And when the war really kicked off, they said like, you know, we already had good access there. And they said, like, you know, if you want to risk it, you can come because it was, you know, the the whole of the southeast at one point was pretty much under siege, you know. Um, well, cities were anyway. So we managed to go down there. We got there. We managed to kind of get into the, the areas that the PKK controlled, that the youth wing had controlled. And basically the Kurds had, had kind of taken over certain cities, like completely. There were militants everywhere. The Turkish Turkish government couldn't get in or out of the city. And they were doing this to kind of say, you know, we're sick of being oppressed, which historically, as anyone that knows about history will know that the Kurds have been oppressed in uh, in Turkey. So they were rising up like this. Um, it, it was quite ill-fated, like most of them got killed. They were young kids, a lot of them, not children, but, you know, teenagers. Um, and it wasn't very well disciplined. Uh, a lot of people say that the PKK were there from the start um to kind of facilitate the uprising but it's not true a lot of it was off the initiative of the youth um which was why it was kind of such a mess honestly but yeah so i, I was filming all of that and then whilst in the areas where the the militants kind of had full control it was okay but then when we ventured out to cities where they were trying to take over so you know half of it was under the control of the kurds half of it was the military and the police still had full control that's when we got arrested. So basically we got captured, um, charged with terrorism. Like initially they were like, you're, you're working with ISIS, which was like, like the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. And then they were saying, you're working with the PKK and ISIS, which is hilarious when, you know, both sides have been fighting each other for 10 years in Syria. So that was insane. Obviously what had happened was we'd been filming very closely with militants we'd witnessed war crimes and they didn't want that getting out. So when they caught us, they arrested us, took all of our footage and gave us these very ridiculous, like trumped up terrorism charges. I'm not terrorist, I've never even fired a gun in my life, you know, it was ridiculous. We were just there doing our job as journalists should, um, you know, and I like to get close to the story. So we embedded with the militants. We couldn't embed with the military, they don't let you. So, you know, that's how we did it. Um, to cut a long story short, you know, we were passed through many different, I think four or five different max security prisons. And then uh, myself and my colleague, Phil, we were we were released and deported back to the UK. And then one of our um, colleagues, Kurdish colleague, he was kept for a longer period, but then eventually he was released and now he's out of the country. Um, but it's still ongoing, man. It's ridiculous. Like five years later and the case is still ongoing. Um, I don't know what we have to do to prove we're not terrorists. You know, I've, I've never done anything like that at all. But as we know, when authoritarian countries don't like what you're doing, that's what happens. And when you were uh, initially detained by uh, Turkish law enforcement agencies, uh, how long was that until you arrived back in the UK? It wasn't too bad. It was uh, 11 days. Okay. I mean, it was but 11 still, days. I mean, 11 days. That I didn't still... like, <laughs> but it was 11 yeah. days. Yeah. So now I want, uh, can you tell us a bit about your time in Armenia and Artsakh in Nagorno-Karabakh? Um, how long was it for? Can you tell us a bit about the chronology of that, what you saw, uh, your experience in um, Nagorno-Karabakh? Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to preface it by saying I wasn't there in 2020. Unfortunately, I couldn't get there when the war was kind of at the height of the, of the clashes. COVID and certain situations here in the UK with other projects meant I couldn't go initially, but I went straight after, you know, a ceasefire came. We went first week of January, I think it was. So we were there. Um, no, maybe the middle. Anyway, um, so, yeah, I mean, I've been really interested in the region since about 2015. When I worked at Vice News, I was constantly pitching, like, we need to go to Karabakh. We need to make a documentary there. It's this frozen conflict. It's fascinating. 
for me, with with you know, I generally cover underreported issues, and certainly Armenia, Artsakh, Azerbaijan, all of that was very underreported, and I felt like it was important to do. Never got there when the war happened in 2016. We were going to go. We got the accreditation. We were ready to go. And then it ended. It was a very short war, four days. So we didn't go then. So this time around, I was like, right, we have to go. I have to go. Managed to get there. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't go, obviously, via the Azerbaijani side. I couldn't do both sides because I've just mentioned that, you know, I'm considered a terrorist in Turkey. Um, and I did make some kind of movements to even inquire and immediately was just told, like, you will, you are not welcome here, basically. Like, there was no way I could go to Azerbaijan safely for myself. I would probably be arrested and maybe deported to Turkey, who knows. So, you know, I did it from the Armenian side, um, which obviously much, much easier, free press, free speech. So uh, we got there and we basically immediately went to Karabakh straight away. Um, and we spent like a good solid week just working 12 hours a day traveling all over Karabakh, uh, meeting with soldiers, went to the front lines, uh, met with loads of civilians. We saw the destruction in Martuni, met with even soldiers whose whole families have been displaced. For example, there was a soldier we interviewed in Amaras. Then we went to Stepanaka and met his family. They were all from Shushi. Now, it's particularly brutal for them because obviously you can literally see Shushi from Stepanaka and the Aziri flag is just hanging there. So it's quite hard for him and his family so I feel like we got a good range, you know, of interviews. We really wanted to find out what's happening now. You know, the, the international press are saying, OK, there's a ceasefire. They're kind of gone home. But with what I do with my company, Popular Front, we kind of look at things a little bit deeper. And we just wanted to know, is this a ceasefire? Is it going to hold? And what is the situation? And honestly, what we found was unbelievably grim, very sad. Um, I was describing it to my friend the other day as just like, the whole time in Artsakh, it felt like we were at a funeral. You know, it's very, very sad. Um, yeah, a lot of people dead. And I'm also curious, as a journalist, uh, did you feel that the Artsakh authorities afforded you the journalistic freedom to report and do as you please? <laughs> well, <clears throat> yes and no. I mean, yes, they did. Definitely the, 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 uh, the Ministry of... Um, uh, what is it? Communications or the, the MFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Artsakh. They were great. But certainly, I think, look, I went to the front lines. You've seen that thread I did on Twitter. And I, what I saw in the front lines was incredibly disheartening. You know, I've covered conflicts all over the world. I've been doing this for seven, eight years now. And the front lines that I saw in Martuni 3 were a disaster, not because of the soldiers. And this is why it kind of made me feel really angry on behalf of the soldiers almost. These are young men who have given their lives. You know, we spoke to one lad. The first lad we spoke to was 18. His brother has been killed in the war. You could just see in his face, he'd seen things, you know, terrible things. As we know, there's been heads have cut off, constant drones. So it's a horrible war. It's a very brutal war. To then go to the front line and see that the trenches are not dug properly. Um, they don't have much equipment. Like, there was no full back lines. The front line was honestly less than a kilometer from where people were living. There was a veteran, a war veteran from the 90s. He was, but he basically kind of formed a civil defense in Martuni. And they just said, look, it's no fault of the soldiers, but the front lines are so close to our homes. We have to be prepared to fight in our homes, you know? And he literally, we got in a car with him. He said, I'll drive you to the front. And I said, okay, like it's going to take a while. It took less than a minute. <laughs> you know, it was insane. Um, so honestly, it was really, really worrying to see that. And, you know, I know for a fact that a charity, a local charity had been donating a lot of the equipment to the soldiers on the front line. Now, not only did I see the mismatching equipment, I actually then went to the charity in Yerevan just to confirm it. And as we got there, they were literally packing up things to send to the soldiers. Why is a charity giving basics like winter clothing and boots to soldiers on the front line when 170 million had just been donated to the country? Now, I'm not Armenian. I have no donkey in this. You know, this is nothing to do with my feelings. It's just what I saw as a reporter. And, you know, I felt like that was quite sad to see. And as soon as I got home, I was like, I'm going to write a thread about this on Twitter because I got a fair following on there and the documentary is not ready yet. Obviously, I'm still editing it. So I just said, look, what's going on out there? I don't know what it is. And, you know, I'm not against Pashinyan. I don't care. It's nothing to do with me, the politics. But what I saw was the reality. And those soldiers were not being looked after properly. Um, and I showed pictures of it. I showed incredibly shallow fortifications. And whilst the ceasefire is on, they should be redigging new fortifications. You know, I'm not a soldier. I never have been. But it would make common like that's common sense, right? Whilst the enemy is not killing you, dig in, dig in. And it, it just wasn't happening. So 
So I did this thread and then I got a weird message from someone at the MFA saying like, you shouldn't have gone to that front line. We told you not to go there. You, you won't get accreditation again. So I tweeted and said, okay, I've just been told I won't be able to get accreditation in ArtSec anymore. But then to be fair to the uh, MFA, after two days, someone else above the person that said this to me contacted me and said, that was a mistake. I don't know why they said that. It's all good. You can come back anytime. So fair play to them. You know, they did that. And one thing I will say, after my thread, I've since seen photos from Martuni 3 and brand new trenches have been drug, uh, dug. The fortifications are much better. So, you know, whilst I know a lot of Armenians were saying you shouldn't have done that, now the soldiers have better trenches. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's something to do with the thread. But those young men have been fighting hard and they need, you know, everything that they can get, I think. Well, because there's a debate going on here in Armenia at the moment where uh, some are saying that we should have, Armenia should have given even more freedom to international journalists to just report as they please. And Emil mm. Gehessen, the British documentary filmmaker, was saying this as well. Whereas others are talking about this security cons concerns and stuff like that. What do you think? Do you think that Armenia can ultimately really benefit from just giving journalists free range to cover and report and document what's going on in Karabakh? I, I think so. And look, I, I understand, you know, I, I know about Emil. I don't know him, but I heard that, you know, I've seen some of the footage from the front lines he, he's been to um, in the trailer. And I know they're kind of not to throw any shade on Emil at all. It's not his fault, but like they're kind of the press friendly ones. You know, they're the ones that the government want you to see. They look good. They're deep, you know, and, you know, that's the way I do my work. I, I'm not I don't want any press tours. I'm not interested in that. So, you know, I know they didn't want us to go to Martuni 3, really, but we went, you know, and Perhaps we shouldn't have, but we did. And I feel like what we did was important. You have to show the reality of what's happening, whether the people or the government like it or not. Now, I know for a fact that the people in Artsakh were very glad that we went there and the soldiers were very glad, quietly off camera, that we were there because they want people to know that the situation isn't actually good enough for them. I mean, one soldier, we even said, do you think this is, you know, do you think that what's happening with the government do you think it's fair? Do you think they've looked after the troops enough? And he said, I can't say on camera because I'm in the military. But it was very clear what he meant by that. He wasn't happy and a lot of other soldiers weren't happy. So I think a journalist's role should never be to make a government happy. It doesn't matter which government it is. It is to look after the people, not look after, but to, to show what the people are seeing, you know. So I think that if Armenia does want to be, you know, free and open, which is the complete opposite of its enemy, Azerbaijan, which is an, you know, openly, uh, a, you know, authoritarian regime, they're open about it. Um, I think if you want to be the opposite of that, you really have to be the opposite of that. However, I will say within any conditions of war, it is understandable. They will say, we don't want the journalists going to this front line. It might be because they don't want a journalist to die, because that would be terrible for them, you know, internationally, if a journalist died whilst you know, helping out and trying to film for the Armenian side or with whatever, you know what I mean? So I get it. Um, and I think it's not necessarily always the role of the government to just say, go where you want. I think it's the role of journalists to work out what's safe, what remit can they work in? Is it worth going? And I think in the case of Armenia and Karabakh, definitely worth it. I, I the, the restrictions, there's no, I didn't feel any restrictions that were particularly insidious. I do think they didn't want us to go to Martuni because they didn't want anyone to see how bad those front lines were. But now we went. They haven't banned us now. Everything's good. So, you know, I think they're doing pretty well. But I think also, again, journalists need to understand that, you know, countries have to have some protection, some safeguarding because they don't want reporters, foreign reporters to just die on the front line, you know. And obviously, you've covered other conflicts uh, in your past, and you've observed this uh, war in Nagorno-Karabakh as well. Was there anything in particular that struck you as different about this war compared to other conflicts you've observed or uh, seen reported on? Yeah. Um, so I would say that considering, you know, I, I take a lot of interest in the area, so I, I was doing my research. I mean, I think we did three podcast episodes about Karabakh with Popular Front before the war even started again. And as an outsider, as a Brit, you know, I'm not Armenian, my family are Armenian or anything like that. Just as a, an observer, it was clear that this war was going to happen again, I think. And to then look at what the governments, both the regime before the, or the Russian allied governments, or whatever you want to call them, and now Pashinyan, to see that the kind of, I think, inaction that they did to, to fortify these front lines and train up the soldiers better, I think it was really weird. Like, I've never really seen that. Even guerrilla armies that I've covered and filmed with, they make preparations. They make more preparations than, you know, a lot of people do. And to see that just 
the front lines you see now in Martunian places, you can look at photos from like 2000 or even like 98 and they don't look much different. That's really bad. The lack of air defense, knowing how many drones that Israel was selling. I mean, that stuff wasn't that wasn't a mystery. Everybody knew that. Everyone knew that was happening. Knowing that Azerbaijan, they put F-16s in Gaza. I To act like that was a shock was very dishonest, perhaps. And I think that the government's lack of preparedness was weird. To me, it was look, it felt like either the government was incredibly naive or they, they just couldn't really be bothered to, to, to take it seriously, you know? Now, I followed the revolution closely and I thought what he was doing was great. He seemed like a much better leader. And I know that a lot of my Armenian friends agreed. However, it's a war now and it's a different situation. You can't ride on being um, popular. You have to actually be a government. You know, you have to be, or at least a leader. You know, you have to be a leader on some sort, especially when war is on, on the horizon. Yeah. And finally, briefly, Popular Front. Can you tell us a bit about the documentary that you're working on, maybe when it's coming out, and just a bit about it, uh, yeah. how people can eventually uh, watch it themselves? Yeah, so uh, Popular Front, for anyone that doesn't know, is my, uh, it's an independent grassroots conflict journalism platform. We make documentaries, we have podcasts, articles, everything. We don't take any money from any corporate investment. So anything we do, it's all grassroots. I, I just prefer it like that. No one can tell us what to do. So we, we went to uh, Karabakh and we're making this documentary right now. It's probably going to be about 40 minutes long, I'd say. It started off as kind of a more deeper news report, I guess, like post ceasefire is the ceasefire really on what are the people saying what has been the cost of the war but now i think it's taken a bit more of a, a different shape i want people to know that there have been beheadings for example when the un says both sides are guilty of war crimes that technically is correct but without context that means nothing so there are maybe four or five videos of you know armenian troops doing some pretty bad things cutting off ears and that it's not good however there are dozens of videos of beheadings, ear cutting, cutting off noses, all from the Azerbaijani side. There's, there's something we include in our documentary of an Azerbaijani soldier cutting off the head of an old man and putting it on a pig. The fact that international reporters are not saying this is unbelievably brutal and just saying both sides have done badness. To me, that's dishonest. So I want to go deeper into that detail. Um, and also, you know, and I know that's grisly, but I think the world has to see it. I think when bad things like that are happening, you have to be shocked if you're living in peace. We're going into that. And then also we're going into the side of how like UNESCO has taken large gifts of money from Azerbaijan and is very quiet on situations in Karabakh. Because a lot of people are saying, well, why isn't the world, why isn't the world listening? And it's very easy to say, well, it's a small region that no one outside of Armenia really cares about, which, which is not true entirely, but you know what I'm saying. But also there is the side that there's been a systematic attempt to kind of deafen reporting on, on Karabakh from the Armenian perspective. We've seen it with the Azerbaijani laundromat where the Azerbaijani elite have been, well, they had a billion dollar slush fund to pay off people. They've paid them off in the EU. They've paid them off in the United Nations. So the West is guilty of accepting bribes and no one is really talking about that, which I think is, is wild. And this isn't conspiracy or speculation. It was all proven by the... Uh, OCCRP. It's, it's a great article. So yeah, so I guess to, to sum up, like we're doing a lot of ground reporting. We went to the front lines. We went very close. We, you know, I mean, we got to a point with the Azerbaijanis, you could throw a rock basically over the front line there. For me, it was important to go that close to see the closest front line. What does it look like there? And to be honest, it didn't look much better than Martuni 3, which was a worry. Um, but yeah, we're doing a lot of ground reporting and then mixing it up with, there's a broader story here. There's a historical fight. You know, this has been going on for a long time. And ultimately, there were other other powers here. It's not just, oh, the Armenians lost. It's the soldiers weren't perhaps being looked after. And there's been some very serious war crimes and serious corruption going on in the background involving the West, which, you know, ironically, the UN says, well, as a, uh, Karabakh belongs to Azerbaijan. But then they don't admit that, oh, yeah, also we've taken a load of bribes from Azerbaijan. So I think it's pretty weird, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jake, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.